on top of the world looking down on creation and the only explanation I can find is the love that I found ever since you've been around your love's put me at the top of the world The Carpenters reflected 70s suburbia with rich harmonies, winning melodies, and a sad refrain. Down on creation and the only explanation I can find. The Carpenters, brother and sister Richard and Karen, were one of the most unique and biggest selling American artists of all time. Carpenters were easy listening, but also they were very hard working, and they are the greatest brother and sister duo of all time. Richard Carpenter was born in New Haven, Connecticut in 1946. Four years later, his sister Karen arrived. Their parents were Harold, who was a printer, and their mother was Agnes, who ruled the house. Richard was actually uh, the quieter child. Uh, it said that he would spend a lot of time on his own, playing the piano and listening to music, whereas Karen was a lot more outgoing. She was very sociable, would be out playing with her friends. Harold and Agnes used to have these fairly formal dinner parties, and after them, both parents would entertain the guests on the piano. And this is partially where Richard got his interest in the piano from. It was really Richard's musical ambitions fashioned what the Carpenters became. When the family moved from Connecticut to Downey, a suburb of Los Angeles in 1963, Richard went off to um, California State College in Long Beach, which was quite a formative time for him musically. He met John Bettis, who would later become one of his major collaborators and songwriting partners. Also, Wesley Jacobs, who would end up playing bass and tuba for the Carpenters. So this was really the period when Richard um, was finding himself musically and starting to experiment. Karen was part of the band at Downey High School. They initially tried to get her involved by forcing her to play the glockenspiel, but Karen, being assertive and outgoing, was having none of that. And she enjoyed listening to the drums. She used to play along to Dave Brubeck records. And once she was allowed to play drums in the choir, then they realized that she was pretty good. <laughs> In 1965, they formed the Richard Carpenter Trio with Wes Jacobs playing tuba and also bass, and they played jazz. Richard started encouraging her to sing. I think it was something which she wasn't entirely confident about at first, but they found out that she had, actually had a really good voice. Music. Karen and Richard joined a friend's trumpet audition at Wrecking Crew bassist Joe Osborne's house. And this was when Karen was first asked to sing in front of anyone else. They went in and Karen, rather gingerly, sang. Joe Osborne said, forget about the trumpet player, this girl could sing. Karen was signed to the, the new label, Magic Lamp, and in fact uh, released a single uh, of two compositions that Richard had written. In 1966, the Richard Carpenter Trio entered the Battle of the Bands, um, an annual competition at the Hollywood Bowl. They played an instrumental version of The Girl from Ipanema and uh, their own composition, something called Ice Tea. Neely Plum, who is uh, the head of RCA Records, gave Richard his card and said, uh, we're interested in signing you. And he said, well, we've already got a deal. We don't need your deal. Then he looked and he recognized the name Neely Plum. It's quite a recognizable name. And he knew who he was. And he backtracked and said, actually, it's just my, my sister has got a deal. It's a solo deal. It's fine. We're, you can have us. After signing with RCA, the Richard Carpenter trio actually recorded a, an album. But the committee decided that they didn't want to release it, so they ended up getting dropped by the label. They formed Spectrum, who dressed alike and played a lot of old jazz standards and easy listening tracks too. And they were also very complicatedly vocal arranged by Richard. 
And Richard started understanding what an instrument Karen's voice was and developing his own flair for arrangements. And this is where what would become the Carpenters duo began to find their feet. After Karen's experience recording with Joe Osborne, Joe had allowed Richard and Karen to continue recording in his own studio. So he, they kept going in, they kept cutting demos. One of these demos um, found its way through Joe to Herb Alpert at a and Records. Herb apparently was intrigued, that's the word he used, by Karen's voice and decided to sign the pair of them. And the first time they met, apparently he walked into the studio, shook Richard's hands, introduced himself and said, let's hope we have some hits. Offering came out in 1969 and it wasn't a huge hit. It had Ticket to Ride, which is the much altered version. And that was really the beginning. So this was, it didn't say anything like what they would, but it was a sign of things to come. Richard insisted that they were called Carpenters and not The Carpenters because he thought it sounded hipper. They'd been influenced by bands like Buffalo Springfield and Bread, and they just didn't want the The. They thought it was cooler to leave it off. The one person who had faith was Herb Alpert. a and were going through a terrible time at that moment, and he was urged to drop this really strange brother-sister duo. Herb Alpert said no. I can see how this is going to work. He's got a ticket to ride. He's got a ticket to ride. He's got a ticket to ride. And he don't care. Carpenters really came to the attention of everyone with the release of Close to You, their reworking of the Burt Bacharach classic. And it went to number one, uh, it was a big hit for them. Why do birds suddenly appear every time you are near? Just like me, they long to be close to you. He said of the arrangement and the way Karen sang it that it was 20 times better than his own version. Carpenters followed the single's release with an album of the same name, which would yield a second international hit for them. Richard heard We've Only Just Begun um, on an advert for a bank in California, and he felt that he could rearrange it. We've only just begun to live. One of the reasons why the song got so big is because it became associated with weddings. It wasn't intended that way, but it became the wedding song of the 1970s. And so that really established the Carpenters. Richard Carpenter was uh, very much known for rearranging pre-existing songs, taking them into this new generation of easy listening music. really popular, songs which hadn't really sold as well in their original form became Carpenter's hits. With Richard's winning formula on board, the group's third album, Carpenter's, became their most successful. Don't you remember you told me you loved me, baby? had their surprisingly edgy version of Leon Russell's Superstar on it. They sold out Carnegie Hall and they were giants. They were selling more records than almost anyone across the world. The album was four times platinum, uh, number two on the album's chart, um, nominated for four Grammys. It won one of them. I think a lot of the appeal was the fact that there was just nothing threatening about them. There was something very, very comforting. And by the early 70s, you're back in a recession. The Carpenters were just smoothing everything over. Funny, but it seems that it's the only thing to do. Run and find the one who loves me. Mo 
most of the verses are descending, so they've got a sense of sadness in a minor key. And almost always the choruses are ascending in a major key. So you have this kind of uncertain feeling of loneliness, you know, rainy days and Mondays, whatever. And then you've got the hope of the, uh, of the chorus. In the early 70s, uh, Carpenters were touring the world and selling out venues everywhere. Europe, America, Japan, they were absolutely huge. No one in the world ever had love as sweet as my love. The fourth album, A Song For You, came out in 1972 and was kind of a concept album or was slightly intended to be, being that the title track, which opened the record, also closed the record as well. got this imperious sorrow that Karen could bring to songs such as Goodbye to Love. Goodbye to love. No one ever cared if I should leave or die. The arrangements are Richard at his best, at his most precise, and at his, his most glorious too. Almost everything that they touched turned to gold, or in sales terms, to platinum. The Day Without You, Goodbye to Love, these were all huge tracks. Every single one of them, incredibly memorable, rather cheesy, slightly sad, and absolutely perfect for any romantic situation, you know, which is one of the biggest selling points of pop music. The 1973 album Now and Then is a really interesting idea. Uh, it was a time when there was a real kind of nostalgia for older songs. Richard Carpenter was known for taking these older tracks and reworking them in that Carpenter style. And the album did that, but also introduced this idea of there being a radio DJ throughout the album, almost kind of hosting. Hey, top good time in Temp Tower. It's 53 degrees at 13 minutes past the Big Boss Hour. And where were you when this song was number one? one. had a song called Yesterday Once More, which was about listening to the oldies. They weren't that old, about 10 years ago, but they were old, old for the time. And then also you had Jambalaya, which is a Hank Williams song. But again, this is the Carpenters who are meant to be representing modern suburban America. And Jambalaya was a fantasy image of the Deep South in maybe the 1930s. So this was the Carpenters looking back on America's past and presenting it in a way that was uh, acceptable to America's present. The first Greatest Hits package released by Carpenters was a massive smash. It ended up being one of the biggest selling records of the year. It went to number one in the UK for like 17 weeks. It went to number one in the US as well. It was absolutely huge. Richard didn't want an ordinary Greatest Hits album. So he went back into the studio and tinkered with the versions of his greatest songs. Horizon was the sixth consecutive platinum certified album, and it was covers. So it featured um, Neil Sedaka's Solitaire, um, Eagles' Desperado, um, most famously, uh, The Marvelettes' Please, Mr. Postman. Into the top of the UK charts, it went platinum in the US, 
and it kept on selling. But mostly this was material which they hadn't written. Carpenters were among uh, some of the first American artists to use music videos to film something specifically to go with their releases. An example of this is uh, Please Mr. Postman, which they filmed in Disneyland. There's Only Yesterday, which, summing up Richard to a T, as his T-shirt tucked in his trousers, his arms folded, looking like he'd no idea why he was there. Really, it's changing styles, and they weren't the only soft rock band to, to suffer from it. Disco was coming in. Contemporary radio was certainly uh, not playing as many soft music artists. The Carpenters branched out into television specials, such as The Carpenters at Christmas and The Carpenters' very first television special. Hi, I'm Richard Carpenter. And I'm Karen Carpenter. Welcome to our first television special. Share the horizon. They kind of had a loose narrative running throughout them. Um, and it's linked together with sketches featuring special guests, also featuring Harold and Agnes, Karen and Richard's parents. And the songs kind of link up the narrative throughout. See, she's at it again, drumming. People are always asking me why Karen plays the drums. I can answer that in two words. Why not? <laughs> Richard thinks it had a lot to do with the reason why they weren't taken more seriously, why Karen's really remarkable voice wasn't lauded in the way it should have been. Like sailing on a sailing ship to nowhere. To go. With musical taste changing in the world, Carpenters released the experimental Passage in 1977. Oh, This is their attempt, I think, of trying to embrace changing musical styles, in particular disco. It was quite jazzy, it had calypso, it even had calling occupants of interplanetary craft, which was one of their great, great moments. Calling occupants of interplanetary craft. This was a, a sort of soft rock space oddity. And it's great. It's a really, really good song. And apparently, there are all these people contacting the Carpenters afterwards saying, when is contact day? When are the aliens coming? You send the message, we declare world contact day. In 1979, uh, it emerged that Richard Carpenter had actually uh, had an addiction to quaaludes. The uh, band had to go on hiatus whilst he went into a rehab centre to deal with this addiction. Meanwhile, Karen was suffering from exhaustion and what is now recognised as anorexia nervosa. Karen took this opportunity to go and experiment musically, so she went to New York to record an album with the producer Phil Ramone. Making love in the afternoon Making love to another beetle This is a totally different world. The lyrics were risque, even sexual. The music was disco-tinged, rock-tinged. It was an album she was incredibly proud of, but unfortunately, uh, Richard and their record label decided it was an album that shouldn't be released, and it was shelved. Richard blocking her album was absolutely devastating for Karen, and she never really recovered from that. And from that point onwards, she really started to um, surrender to her eating disorder and her health problems increasingly got worse. Their final album, Made in America, only sold 200,000 copies. It did produce their last top 20 hit, um, Touch Me When We're Dancing. In 1982, Karen moved to New York to see a therapist regularly. She received a hospital process called hyperalimentation, 
which is a sort of artificial way of putting on weight. She moved back home and she did one final performance before her heart gave out. It was shocking, you know, she was only 32. I don't think anyone expected her to die in that way. And I think she was really one of the first people to be such a high profile person to succumb to anorexia in that way. They long to be close to you. The legacy of The Carpenters um, is one of huge success. Over the 11 albums they released, they've sold to date around 100 million records. Karen's voice. Uh, so many singers have credited her as, uh, as an influence from the likes of Beyonce to Madonna. You know, she is and was one of the greatest female singers of all time. Richard and Karen Carpenter showed that you can make clean, perfect sounding records and still sell millions of records. Just like me, they long 